So we've been going through the book of Proverbs in our every Sunday and studying. Today on our study in the book of Proverbs, we're not in Proverbs. We're going to be in the book right before that, the book of Psalms. We're going to be uh, in Psalm 34. Now, Proverbs is, is a very practical, pragmatic book, and it teaches us some things to do and things to avoid. And I felt it was almost getting to the point of uh, over, overwhelming do this, don't do that, and, and we're trying to turn our life around, so I wanted to just stop and, and maybe not scold you. I felt like I may have scolding you a little bit there. I want to give you some encouragement today, so we're, we're going to take a little breather and read in the book of Psalms, Psalm 34. Now, I want to, uh, before we cover the opening verses here, I want to just give a little clarity. Often in your Bible, when you open your Bibles, you'll see at the beginning of sections, the editors of our English Bible, the publishers, have put little titles, okay? And uh, I think, you know, that's not actually part of the Bible. It's, it's there as a tool to help you know what's coming up next, okay? So right before the passage about Jesus' birth, for instance, it would say, Jesus is born in Bethlehem. Okay, we all, we all know that. It's like, you know, little helpers in the book. Those aren't really scripture. They're not actually God's word, except in the book of Psalms. You'll notice, in little print, I hope, that there is headers above each psalm. Those are part of scripture. And they've been there since the book of Psalms was put together by God's hands. So, uh, for instance, you'll notice, the if you look back on your page, if you have Psalm 34 before you, Psalm 32 says, a psalm of David, a maskil. You go, okay, that's nice. It was written by David. I don't know what a maskil is, but that's why we kind of gloss over these sometimes. I look at verse 30, or Psalm 35. It says, a psalm of David. And Psalm 33 doesn't have anything. Maybe like you, I know I've done this, where I've sometimes glossed over those. The print's kind of tiny anyway, isn't it? Well, we're going to read it today. So if you have your Bibles, and it will certainly be on the screen up here, we're going to read the intro, call it verse zero, okay? And then we're going to read the first three verses to get started of Psalm 34. And I want to point out right up front, they're not going to seem like they go together, but they do, all right? So it says, a psalm of David when he feigned madness before Abimelech, who drove him away and he departed. What does that mean? We're going to find out. By way of clarity, Abimelech is not a guy's name. It's a title for the king of the Philistines, okay? Like Pharaoh or like chancellor or president. It's just what his title was. I only say that because we're going to have another guy later on in this sermon named Ahimelech with an H. So just like when you named your kids the same letter and you regretted it later on, why did we name them all with starting with a J? I don't know. Ahimelech and Abimelech are different guys, okay? So let me start again. The intro and the first three verses. A psalm of David when he feigned madness before Abimelech, who drove him away and he departed. Verse 1. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul will make its boast in the Lord. The humble will hear it and rejoice. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. Lord, how blessed it was to just magnify you and exalt your name in song. And now we see the words of David, and he's doing just that. Would you touch our lives with your word, and may it uh, touch our hearts in the way you want it to. In your name I pray, amen. So what does this little trio of verses here about how great God is, and how wonderful his name is, and how amazing God is, have to do with David pretending He's insane, because that's how it starts here. David is, finds himself in a situation, and we're going to go back and look at the actual story, and God rescues him from it. Now, I didn't, as often happens when, when the songs are put together, they don't know what I'm going to be speaking on. Yet the last song we sang, God is mighty to save, fits this perfect. God is mighty to save, and he's mighty to save when you realize you have no place else to turn. 
David literally has to decide that he can trust God in this. That's kind of a big thing. We talk about trusting God and believing in God and, you know, from believing he exists to actually trusting him for doing the right thing. But often we do that when I've exhausted all possibilities of me being in control of a problem. And I finally say, I've lost control. God, you have to save me. Perhaps he wants us to do that before we've done all that. So if you would keep your fingers or your bulletin or something in Psalm 34 and turn back a little bit to the book of 1 Samuel, chapter 21, let's find out what's going on with this story. huh? First Samuel 21, I want to start at verse uh, 8. I'll lay a little groundwork for you here. David is the son-in-law to King Saul. His best friend is Saul's son, Jonathan. His brand new wife is Saul's daughter, Michael. And everything's coming up David until King Saul turns on him. If you're familiar with the Old Testament, this part of it, this is just after he slew the giant Goliath. And Saul seemed to think David was getting all the glory, and he turned against his new son-in-law, David. And David is now an outlaw, and he's on the run, okay? So if I pick it up at verse 8, he's pretending with the priest, the other guy, Ahimelech, okay? And he asks Ahimelech uh, for some help. So he's at the tabernacle. Verse 8, David said to Ahimelech, Now is there not a spear or a sword on hand? For I brought neither my sword, nor my weapons with me, because the king's matter was urgent. Uh, He's being dishonest here, by the way. That's a different sermon. We're going to probably get to that soon. Verse 9, Then the priest said, The sword of Goliath, the Philistine, whom you killed in the valley of Elah, behold, it is wrapped in a cloth behind the ephod. If you would take it for yourself, take it. For there is no other except it here. And David said, There's none like it. Give it to me. Then David arose and fled that day from Saul. And he went to Achish, king of Gath. I'll just tell you, Achish is the name of the Abimelech. i got to get those correct. Okay. And he's fled south of the border, much like uh, we hear of somebody fleeing south of the border in New Mexico so he'd escape the law. That's kind of what David's doing here. He fled south. And uh, verse 11, But the servants of Achish said to him, Is this not David, the king of the land? Did they not sing of this one as they danced, saying, Saul has slain his thousands and David his ten thousands? That's exactly the poetry that got David in trouble. As people sang about how great Saul was, they sang greater about David, and Saul became jealous. So now he's on the run from Saul. He's in an even bigger pickle, though, because the one he did this to was Goliath, and he's now in Goliath's hometown. Not a good refugee move, by the way. Okay, verse 12. Uh, So the, the servants of the Philistine king are saying this about David. Verse 12. David took these words to heart and greatly feared Achish king of Gath. 13. So he disguised his sanity before them and acted insanely in their hands and scribbled on the doors of the gate and let his saliva run down into his beard. Uh, Acts like, you know, like we used to do in fifth grade when we thought we were being cute, okay? Verse 14, then Achish uh, Achish said to his servants, Behold, you see the man behaving as a madman. Why do you bring him to me? Do I lack madmen that you've brought this one to act the madman in my presence? Shall this one come into my house? He's actually kind of pointing probably at his own crew there, his own cabinet. Do I lack madmen? You guys. Get him out of here. What does this tell us about what David's going through? Because I've got to match the first three verses of Psalm, to the, of Psalm 34 to this. They don't seem to match. Let's go back to Psalm 34. David's actually in a very desperate need here, and there's nothing he can do to get out of it. He's on the run and he goes to the one place he shouldn't be and he's carrying the sword of the guy he just killed. Now, I'm not big into weapons, but some of my family are into blades and stuff and they know these things by sight. 
I got some a son-in-law that's great into Lord of the Rings, and I, he knows what Glamdring looks like. That's Gandalf's sword. How do you know that? Oh, don't you know? Well, sure. I, I mean, I just forgot. You know? <laughs> no. But people into weapons can recognize this, and they recognize Goliath's sword. I think it's probably confiscated because it's never mentioned again in Scripture. It was quite a trophy. And so they, if somebody's hauling Goliath's sword, it's got to be the killer of Goliath. And so the cabinet of the king of the Philistines says, we think this is David. He's public enemy number one. What's David going to do? He can't go back. He can't go forward. He can't call for help. His family is against him. His in-laws are against him. He's got nobody to call on but the Lord. So the first three verses are how the story ends with God saving, doing great things. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. But the rest of the psalm points to how he felt at the time. Now, some commentaries will say that David lacked faith here, and this is him lacking faith. I think this is something that God gave him. It was his only escape. He's in custody, and he somehow convinces the king that he's not David. He's just a crazy dude that thinks he's David because he's got the sword. So he's, I'll keep the sword, but get rid of him. I don't need him around. There was actually some great superstitions in those days about people that, that uh, had insanity. In fact, he does something very debasing to him that we maybe don't get when it says he let spittle run down his beard. That would have been a very humiliating thing to do. In that culture, uh, we were just having a little beard discussion today of noticing one of the signs of fall is all the, the beards, and they get thicker, and sometimes we get a little unkempt. But in that culture, you didn't get that way, and you certainly never let food or saliva be in your whiskers. And for him to do that means he had to exercise some very big humility. I know some of you are going, but yeah, well, I'm trying to remember what I had for dinner, you know. <laughs> Not here. This was humiliating for him. God offers him a way of escape, but it costs him some pride. That's something we're going to learn here. So let's read verses 4 through 11 now, the rest of the, about the, uh, not the rest of the psalm, but the rest of what I want to read from here. Uh, and it starts off with an, a choice that David makes in verse 4. I sought the Lord, and he answered me, and delivered me from all my fears. They looked to him and were radiant, and their faces will never be ashamed. This poor man cried and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and rescues them. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. How blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Oh, fear the Lord, you his saints. For those who fear him, there is no want. The young lions do lack and suffer hunger, but they who seek the Lord shall not be in want of any good thing. Come, you children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. David, I don't think, feels like God's with him. Sometimes you, maybe you've experienced that. You've needed God's comfort, and you've prayed, or somebody's prayed for you, or you've sought the scriptures, or you just listened to a song, and you've literally felt God's comfort. Been there? Amen, if you have. Have you ever felt God not there? Yeah. You know what? He's still there. David, I think that's what's going on with David because he says, uh, he talks about all his fears at the end of uh, verse 4. He felt fear. That's the feeling he had. And it's a different word for fear than we saw elsewhere in the chapter. We're going to talk about that. But he makes a conscious decision, a choice, to trust God anyway. I sought the Lord. That's the choice he makes right there. And he delivered me from what? How I felt. My fear. Two words in Hebrew for fear, by the way. This first one here, he delivered me from all my fears, is uh, pachad. That's the Hebrew way to say it. And that's, we, could, we would call it terror. That's that 
overwhelming horror, that terror that we feel when danger, that dread that's upon us. That, is, that kind of fear is the problem. Then maybe it's somewhat confusing unless we look a little closer in verse 7, twice in verse 9, and once in verse 11. He says, oh, I want you to have the fear of the Lord. I want you to fear the Lord. How blessing, blessed it all is. It's a blessing to you when you fear the Lord. Different word, by the way, a different meaning. This word is yare. We would call it reverence, an awesome respect for God. And it is not the problem, it is the answer. When you have pachad, the answer is to seek the Lord with yare, utmost respect and reverence. And now my feelings are following my will and not the other way around. Emotions and decisions. Boy, that's a conflict for a lot of us, isn't it? Sometimes my emotions drive my decisions. But decisions ought to drive emotions. So we come across a phrase here, and maybe you've come across this as you've read verse 8. It says, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Is that familiar to anybody? I think it's in song, and, and we, maybe we put that on plaques and different things, and uh, on a ribbon in your Bible, perhaps. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Sounds so nice, doesn't it? It's actually a command. It is brought to you to do this. There's the taste, that's the decision, and see, observe, get the facts. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Do the research, guys. Is God good? Check him out. And I don't know if I'm making too much of this. I didn't really look this word up, but my personal observation here is the word taste isn't take a big bite off and swallow it whole. Sometimes I can't do that. I don't have enough faith yet. But do I have enough to even just, uh, yeah, I know God's good. Of course he's good. Everything around us points to a good God. So I can deal with some of these things. Then when it says fear the Lord, it means trust in the Lord. Now, my translation says uh, in verse 8, how blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Uh, Verse 22 is going to use the same word, takes refuge. That's just the graphic picture of trusting in God, literally placing your trust in him. Fearing God is trusting God. So are you trusting God? What What does that even mean to trust God? How's it feel to trust God? What do you do? You just sit there and go, what are you doing, Mark? Trusting? What does that mean? I don't know, but it, I'd feel silly if I said I wasn't trusting God. It means you're satisfied with the answers God brings. Because they're probably not my answers. David's answer was to run. David's answer was to get a sword. David's answer was to do anything but Trust God. And God gives him a rather humiliating answer, and it works. Can we trust God with that? See, trusting God is not this easy, comforting, falling into the arms of God kind of thing. It's a very difficult thing because I have to lay my will and my decisions aside. That's how salvation works, isn't it? I'd like to keep rules. I'd like to negotiate with God. I want to be good enough for God to like me and let me into heaven. That isn't how it is. I have to admit I'm a sinner. Nothing I can do is good enough to get to God. So Jesus went to the cross and paid for my sin, and that's how I get to God. I just trust him for that. I'm going to be satisfied with that answer. That's how the whole thing works. So there's a necessary humility i got to have here, and I want to point out some things about a very famous verse. 1 Peter chapter 5. Maybe you know where I'm going to go. If you have any familiarity with the Scriptures at all, maybe you grew up in Sunday school and you learned Bible verses, maybe you know 1 Peter 5, 7. It's another one that we, we paste on, on uh, posters and, and uh, we put at the bottom of an email to comfort people, right? So verse 7, if I remember right from my Bible memory days, says, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Did you get the King James in there? He careth. He careth so much for me. (laughs) Isn't that a comforting thing? Do you know this isn't a comforting verse? Perhaps we think it is. It brings comfort. But it too is a command. 
So let's start way back at verse 5, and I want to read down to verse 11, and I want to put the verse 7 in the middle here and realize there's not a comforting hallmark card phrase in the verse 5 or afterwards. Let's just pick it up there. In fact, verse 5 is going to sound out of context. It's going to say, You younger men, likewise, be subject to your elders. And all of you, clothe yourself with humility toward one another. For God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Let me just comment about verse 5. It starts off telling, You young guys in church need to make sure that you submit to the elders in church. Well, that's not comforting. But 1 Peter's written in a time when there were a lot of people wanting to kill Christians for their faith. It was deadly, and chapter 5 starts with an admonition to the elders to say, you got to do this job because you want to do it. People's lives depend on it. If you make a mistake leading the church, people could be killed. And you people in church, you've got to trust these men. They know what they're doing. Lay yourself aside, clothe yourself in humility, because that's how God works. That's verse 5. Their very survival could depend upon their obedience here. In fact, the word for clothe yourself is literally putting on an apron so you don't get messy. Okay, now I gotta tell you, I don't look good in an apron. Um, somebody said I look good today because I have the blazer on. I thought, how did I look last Sunday? Was that a mess? Did I have an apron on? <laughs> Aprons have a purpose. They keep your clothes clean and they keep you from getting burned and splashed, but nobody decides, uh, I'm, I'm rocking this apron, I think I'm gonna wear it out. No, it's, it's, it's a purpose. None of us like putting on humility, but it's vital to make things happen. So there's this admonition for humility. Verse six says, therefore humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. This is the mighty hand that saves, by the way, that he may exalt you at the proper time. And then let's interrupt the verse mid-sentence with the caring part, casting all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Let's get back to the lesson here. Verse eight, be of sober spirit. Be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour, but resist him. Firm in your faith, knowing that the same experiences of suffering are being accomplished by your brethren who are in the world. After you've suffered for a little while, the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ will himself perfect, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be dominion forever and ever. Amen. Wow, there's a lot there about submitting and resisting, and that doesn't sound very greeting card to me. Does it to you? I like verse 7. That one I can use. We call it a promise of God. Nobody sees that in a greeting card, do they? Oh, I got a birthday card. Resist the devil. <laughs> do you look at the promises of God sometimes at about that level of authority? About like a greeting card, well wish? God says he'll never leave us or forsake us. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Has about that much authority sometimes. It's a lot richer than that. Nobody goes into a bank and goes up to their teller and says, yes, I was able to blow out all my birthday candles at my birthday yesterday, and I want to cash that in. I want to cash in my wish. No, what is that? That's just fun. These promises have the weight of cashing a check, not of just something like, I know God's going to be there. It sure is nice. And they come with specific commands for us to do. Submit to one another. That's tough because we're taught, stand up for yourself. Fight for what's right. That, that's built into us, by the way, to, to fight. And God says, you end up fighting me. Pride versus humility. Um, how's this work? If I'm, if I'm exalting myself and not Christ, I'm, I'm probably stepping into sin. I'm not stepping into faith here. That necessary humility comes when God says, I need you to lay yourself aside. Then I can take care of your anxieties and cares. This whole verse, though, by the way, is not about let go and let God. Remember that little phrase we have? 
Let go and let God have his wonderful way. I know what they're saying there as far as lighten up, but that's not a passive thing. It takes strength and it takes intentionality to let go of things. This verb of cast is only used one other time in the Bible. It's used in the, in the book of Luke when the people are seeing Jesus come in on the donkey. At the, uh, they're all saying Hosanna on Good Friday, not Good Friday, Palm Sunday, and they, th- they cast their cloaks in front of him. It was used when you were going to cast a net out in fish. There's effort involved in casting. It's not just letting go. You're throwing something away. God says, you throw those things at me. I don't want to throw those things away. I would lose control of them. That's the point. You get to David's point. You have to get rid of it. So I've got to ask myself a question. Do I really believe that God cares enough? Does he, does he know what he's doing? Will he do the right thing? He's not changing the subject then after this in verse 8. And he says, cast your anxieties on him. Be on the alert. You have an adversary, and he's lying to you. He says, resist the devil and listen to God. Then why do sometimes I find myself doing the exact opposite? I listen to the devil, and I resist God. I don't get it both ways. And here's a stunning fact. Whoever I choose not to listen to, I'm resisting. I'm either listening to God or the enemy. I'm ever in neutral. That's kind of sobering. But God will bring you to a point of tension where you have to decide. And it's you to decide. Well, don't leave us there, Mark. You said it's going to be encouraging. It is going to be encouraging. So just a, back in the book of Hebrews, it's about that far back in your Bible, okay? Hebrews 13, the very last chapter of Hebrews 13. A couple of verses there, verses 5 and 6. Um, and by, when you see the, the text all in caps up there on the screen, that means he's quoting from the Old Testament here. So the writer of Hebrews is trying to say, you've known about this. You grew up with this stuff. Back in your Old Testament Bibles, I'm just repeating here what God has to say. Verse 5, he says, Make sure that your character is free from the love of money. We'll get back to that in a second. It's not a money lesson here. Uh, Being content. There's the lesson. Being content with what you have. For he himself has said, I will never desert you, nor will I ever forsake you, so that, we have com- so that we confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What will man do to me? I will never leave you or forsake you or desert you as forsake you. There's another verse maybe we, we put out there as, as a sweet little verse, but it's actually a statement of fact. It's a statement of evidence in a case. Sometimes I feel like I'm on my own. Do you? I don't feel God's presence, and yet he's always there. I, when I came across that, I thought of a song I'd heard. I had to search, I don't know how long. I wasted a couple hours trying to find this song. Evidently, there's, the song's called He's Always There. There's two other songs that are newer called He's Always There, and I was getting more and more frustrated because I don't listen to that new music anymore. Okay. I finally found it, and I got the lyrics, and it's a wonderful, sweet song. I remember singing it in Sunday school when I was a kid. Maybe you know it. He's always there when things go wrong. Maybe the words are in the bulletin there. He's always there, and he gives a song. He lifts me up when I'm in prayer. He's never gone when I'm alone. He's always there. Did anybody else grow up with that song? Am I it? Good, well, there's a second verse. Okay. He's up on the mountain and he's down in the sea. He fills the heavens, yet he lives in me. I need not worry or have a care. He's never gone when I'm alone. He's always there. That was written by Arthur Unknown. No, Author Unknown. I don't know who wrote it. I couldn't find much on it. But I found the lyrics uh, tucked in a little blog site. And I... 
I'm saying it to myself, and Cindy's in the other room, and she can know that I'm muttering something. She goes, what, did you tell me something? No, I'm singing this song to myself. I, so, made an awkward day for her, too. I don't remember that truth any more than, I sh- than you do, and we should. But it's a promise, and it's a fact. It's more than just a promise. It is an investigative fact. That's, that's the way this is written. Here's the evidence, and therefore, here's how we're going to present the case. God will never leave you or forsake you. He starts off with this talk about money. In fact, if you have the King James or the New King James, it says, put away covetousness. That says it pretty graphically. I almost read from the New King James today for that reason. Free from the love of money. That's an internal thing. Coveting, you recognize that? That's one of the Ten Commandments, right? It's number ten. Well, there's a thing about coveting. Nobody can see you do it. Only God knows when you do that. Coveting is when you're not content. But anytime I break commandments one through nine, I've already broken number 10 then because I'm experiencing discontent. Because I have to look out for myself. I have to be in control. I have to solve this problem my way, as I would tell myself. But God says, I'm not going to let you down. That's not what pleases me. What pleases me is when you trust me and be satisfied with my answer because he uses the word, I will never desert you nor ever forsake you. What does never mean? Never means never. It doesn't mean usually. It doesn't mean probably never. It doesn't mean most of the time. It means never. When God says, I will never leave you, he's going to be there for you, whether you feel like it or not. How do I know that? Because Jesus went to the cross. He didn't have to do that. So let's break this down to why I can trust God. Let's go back and think about the book of Proverbs as we've been covering it now for about 13 chapters of Proverbs. We've seen some things about being wise about being righteous, about not being a fool, about trusting God, because three things about God. Number one, he's sovereign. That means he's in control. He's in control of everything. You can't suffer harm unless God is going to use that, unless God allows that. You can't endure good Until God grants it. God is in control of everything. Sometimes we struggle with our what's coming up with our health. Some of you have got that on your plate. We all have a a great election coming up that's uh, shall we say not normal. We're not having a normal four year election. We live in weird times, don't we? There's war and rumors of war going on around the world. We all have family members that we can't help, and all we can do is pray. God's sovereign. He's in control. Second thing about God, he's all wise. Or we can say he knows what he's doing. It's great for God to be in control, but does he know what he's doing? Because sometimes it doesn't feel like he knows what he's doing. Yes. In fact, the word that we use is he's omniscient. That means he knows everything. Oh, well, how many times have we done that? Well, if I had only known, I would have decided different. Even something simple like buyer's remorse. Remember the last time you bought a car and two days later, you say, why did we, I shouldn't have got that car, shouldn't have got the truck. By the way, I I pick on you a lot, Rodney, but listen, they know you're going to feel that way. So a good salesman will say, now in a couple days, you'll experience what they call buyer's remorse. Don't worry, that's normal. This is still a really good thing you're doing, so it's, it's, just, it's just something that happens to people. When you experience that, no, you still have a good truck. Uh, and yet then they try to say, however, we have an extended warranty you better buy. <laughs> Please support your local Toyota dealer, okay? <laughs> Love you, man. God is all, he's sovereign, he's in control. He's omniscient and all-knowing. He knows what he's doing. The third one is what really kicks it into high gear, and that is, 
He is loving. God loves you. He cares. You can cast everything on him because he cares. He cares about everything. You've heard the verse, and we brought this up before. He cares about how many hairs are on your head. For some guys, that's, we're down into double digits now, right? <laughs> Maybe you care about that. But if he cares about that, does he care about how many blades of grass are in your yard? Yeah, he knows that figure. He cares about the birds that eat there. He cares how many stink bugs get into your house. Maybe you care about that one too. You see, there's things that I don't really care about that God does care about. He does know about. He cares because he loves you. And don't just bat that phrase around either. I like to admonish you. No, he loves you. He didn't have to let you survive, but he's got you going this far. He loves you. He didn't have to give you any good things, but he gave you a lot of good things. He loves you. And about all the mistakes I made, he loved me so much he went to the cross and he died. And that's good enough evidence for me. You see, hell's a horrible place. It's real. And if you don't turn to Christ, it's there. God made a way. He's in control. He knows what he's doing, and he cares. And no matter how I feel about it, I can choose to believe God. Not because I have all the facts, but because God is trustworthy. So be encouraged. As much as the Bible tells us things to do and things to avoid, we don't do it alone. We have a great God that's mighty to save. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for being mighty. I, I didn't know we were going to sing that song. <laughs>